I'm really pleased to welcome a former colleague uh, and, a, and a close friend uh, to the Bush School this evening. Uh, Professor Gregory, uh, you may have read, he's uh, authored something like 12 books and over 100 articles. Uh, he, uh, he is one of the, uh, probably the most well-known uh, expert on the Soviet economy. And then uh, with the demise of the Soviet Union, he became the expert on transition economics. And uh, he is uh, uh, very much a, uh, an important player. He is uh, a, a chaired professor at the University of Houston, where he and I were faculty members many years ago, uh, before I got lured to A&M. Uh, but, but Paul is also spends most of his time uh, at the Hoover Institute, where he's a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. Um, Professor Gregory, for those of you that aspire to live an academic life, uh, Professor Gregory is the ultimate. He knows kind of where to spend his time. And um, uh, he, uh, I, have, I have visited uh, uh, Paul uh, in Hawaii where he was affiliated with the East-West Institute. I visited him uh, also in Davos, Switzerland, where he managed to uh, have some type of uh, arrangement there. And then uh, again in Berlin at the uh, Free University of Berlin, where he was a visiting professor and today holds a, uh, an associated uh, research uh, arrangement with one of the other universities there. So. Uh, he knows, uh, he knows where to travel, and he knows uh, he, uh, he's, he manages to live well, and so... On little money. I don't know. Davos, Switzerland, uh, you know, I'm not going to buy that, folks. Uh, so in any event, uh, he's going to talk to us tonight about an issue that has as I, as an economist, uh, am particularly interested in the issue of sanctions. Because the, the received wisdom among economists is that sanctions don't work. The free market is so flexible that people find a way around sanctions, and therefore, why bother? And I think this is a terribly important issue because sanctions have been applied against Russia. They've also been applied against Iran. And Iran, of course, is, is saying, let's release these sanctions. They're, they're acting like the sanctions really matter. Uh, but I want to hear from somebody that, uh, that has studied this. And so, uh, uh, Paul, I'm going to turn this over to you. We're going to have about 30 minutes for his talk. And then, uh, then he and I will sit here. I'll, I'll uh, kind of entertain questions from you. We've got a real small group tonight, but that's good because you can ask questions and we can have a dialogue. So I'm really look forward to that. And so, Professor Gregory. Thank you, Jim. So, Jim, we go to this mic. Yeah. So, Jim has um, indicated his wisdom by the fact that he has learned to follow me around, so, uh, but he has not visited me in Palo Alto yet, so that has to be... This summer. Okay, that'll be this summer. Uh, this is the title of my talk. Uh, I'm going to make it much more informal than I had originally planned. Uh, one reason for this is that I prepared some PowerPoints, and I taught a class this morning, and I presented uh, the PowerPoints, and the lecture was rather dreadfully boring. So uh, I think I'll operate on a much more informal level. I am pleased that the, the crowd is small, and I will try to make this as uh, brief as possible, because I'm much more interested in the discussion that uh, follows and in the actual uh, presentation. So if you could turn this off. Um, 
I'll go back to the screen uh, when I have some charts that I think are interesting uh, to look at. As advertised, uh, this paper is about the effect of low energy prices and sanctions on the Russian economy and hence on the behavior of the Russian president, uh, Vladimir Putin, and um, perhaps as a constraint on uh, Russia's foreign policy. So it's a rather difficult task to disentangle the effects of the sanctions from the effects of the uh, collapse of oil prices. I can't do it very well, but I think uh, you can sort of distinguish the two. Uh, now, if you ask the Russians about this, and there is a Russian propaganda campaign that is underway, the word you would get is the sanctions are a, are a laughing matter. They really have not hurt us. If they've hurt anyone, it's the businesses in Europe, in Germany, in France, Italy, uh, who do business with us. Uh, we have built up these huge reserves in the form of central bank reserves, in the form of um, rainy day funds. So we can weather this. You're only hurting yourself. Uh, do away with the sanctions. It'll be good for you. It's we don't mind if you remove the sanctions. I must say as well that um, uh, the, the sanctions from the West are um, very tenuous because there is great there are great differences of opinion among the European powers about these sanctions. Uh, the, the further south you go in Europe, the more opposition you get to the sanctions, and then you have opposition to sanctions in rather unusual places uh, like uh, uh, former satellites of, of the Soviet Union. So um, I will talk about sanctions, but I think, and about the effect of uh, low energy prices, but first I think uh, it's important to uh, set the setting uh, for the sanctions. Uh, you may recall that the sanctions came in three waves. The first wave was with the annexation of Crimea, which was in April of um, 2014, as I recall. The second came after the shooting down of the Malaysian airline, Flight 17, that was in July. And the third set came in August of 2014 after uh, regular Russian forces invaded Ukraine. Uh, when I say that, uh, I uh, will be heatedly disputed by um, Russian propaganda because the official Soviet, a Russian line is there are no regular Russian troops anywhere in East Ukraine. There may be Russians there, there, they may be Russian soldiers, they may be wearing Russian uniforms without uh, insignias, but if they're there, they're there because they have volunteered uh, to fight in East Ukraine, and many of them, in fact, are in East Ukraine on vacation. Uh, uh, and it's an unfortunate way to use, lose your life on vacation uh, in East Ukraine. So this is one of the most sensitive issues uh, in Russia today, which is concealing the fact that there have been substantial casualties uh, as a result of the um, war in uh, East Ukraine. And one of the few organizations that uh, the Russian government cannot shut up uh, are these uh, societies of mothers of Russian soldiers. So they uh, led the uh, movement against the Afghanistan war, and if the casualties continue, uh, they will uh, be a 
potent force for Putin to keep quiet. So that's how the sanctions came about. And note that in order to get the sanctions approved by this unruly coalition of Europeans in the United States and Canada and Australia, something dramatic had to happen. Uh, even the annexation of Crimea elicited very mild sanctions against Russia. We should not forget the enormous significance of that annexation because this was the first change by force of national boundaries of the post-war period, if, if we speak about um, the Western world. The peace of that we've experienced since the end of World War II has really been based on the notion of the fixity of, of national boundaries. So the annexation of Crimea was not small potatoes uh, in the course of uh, world history. So that elicited uh, very mild uh, sanctions. We would probably not have the sanctions in place today were it not for the fact that a Russian uh, book missile crew uh, happened to shoot down a Malaysian passenger jet. And there is all kinds of evidence uh, as to how this was done. And the Russian media continues to deny this. Uh, the third shock that caused sanctions to be in, increased was the invasion by regular forces um, of East Ukraine uh, in August. And this invasion was uh, ordered by Russia because the Ukrainian forces, even though they're quite weak and, and poorly organized, were on the verge of defeating the so-called uh, separatist forces. And the fact that Putin uh, ordered the regular Russian army in to prevent uh, the defeat of these separatists tells us uh, how seriously he takes this matter and underscores the fact that he's not going to give in easily. So that's really the, the setting. Uh, and let me explain where we are right now. We have uh, these three sets of sanctions in place. We have the Russian narrative that the sanctions are not much of a bother. They're more of a cost to uh, those uh, uh, introducing the sanctions and to Russia. Um, we still have uh, we, uh, Ukraine has yet to receive serious deliveries of lethal weapons from any uh, Western power, um, even though the U.S. Senate appears to be strongly behind such a, a move, but the uh, president uh, uh, does not seem terribly interested, and I would be quite surprised if the U.S. delivers weapons before the end of uh, Obama's term. We have two so-called People's Republics, the People's Republic of Donetsk and the People's Republic of Luhansk, which are firmly under rebel control, which means firmly under Moscow control. Uh, and we now are in the third or fourth month of what is called the Minsk II Peace Accord, uh, during which hostilities have diminished somewhat. Uh, there's still fighting going on on a daily basis. I believe yesterday something like 10 Ukrainian soldiers were killed. So on a daily basis there are casualties, uh, even though we are supposedly in this uh, period of peace. Uh, Putin is now deciding what to do next. The sanctions may affect his decision because if he now proceeds further to build this so-called land bridge uh, to the Crimea, which would involve um, attacking um, the port city of Mariupol and other towns and villages along the way, 
he understands if he does this, this will mean a prolongation and perhaps a deepening of, of sanctions. So we really don't know what's going to happen now. Uh, he might work on this land bridge. There's concern that he will uh, perhaps conduct hybrid warfare in the Baltic states. Uh, he is currently uh, saber rattling with nuclear weapons, uh, hoping that this will in, in, intimidate uh, the West. So we're in this period of waiting right now. We really don't know what's going to happen. If you look at the Western view of things, you primarily hear the following, and that is that um, we must resolve this through peaceful means. This is a prominent theme of Angela Merkel, in Germany, it's a, it's a prominent theme of uh, President Obama. It's a prominent theme of uh, Hollande, Hollande in, in France. So somehow the West hopes that we can find a peaceful solution to this conflict. I personally do not really see how a peaceful resolution can come about. Therefore, we have a real stalemate problem. And let me explain why. Because Putin, from the very beginning, has uh, uh, outlined his terms for peace. And his term for peace is something he calls federalization. It took the Europeans a while to figure out what federalization means. Merkel uh, took a while to figure it out as well because she heads the Federal Republic of Germany. And so federal sounds fine, but what Putin means by federalization is that the uh, People's Republic of Donetsk and Luhansk become a part of a, um, of a unitary Ukraine with the authority and power to veto any major policy uh, undertaken in Kiev. Which means, if this were accepted, there would be, no longer be any Ukraine. Ukraine would cease to exist, because if Texas could tell Washington uh, what uh, it can or cannot do, the United States would cease to exist at that point. I haven't got to sanctions yet, which is what Jim is expecting to hear. Uh, so let me take a look at the sanctions. And as I say, uh, one of the problems is that we're trying to sort out the effect of sanctions from the effect of collapsing energy prices, which means two things are going on at once, so it becomes somewhat unclear. We do uh, have an advantage, which is rather rare in history and in economic history, of uh, two events which are very similar. And those two events which are very similar are the uh, financial crisis of 2008-2009, which hit Russia along with other countries, it hit Russia a little harder than other countries. And now we have the current situation uh, of low energy prices and sanctions. And let me explain why the two events are quite, simple, uh, quite similar. The major effect, if you look at the sanctions program of um, the United States and Europe, they consist of three Parts. Part number one is that um, certain individuals uh, lose the a, a privilege or ability to hold assets and bank accounts abroad. They are restricted uh, in their travel. 
uh, and so on. Uh, these um, sanctions apply to uh, Putin's inner circle. They apply to officers who are active in East Ukraine, uh, politicians who are active in, in um, Crimea, and so on. We have really not made much use of that part, although I think this would be very effective because if Putin's inner circle, all of whom are billionaires, felt their assets, which they must hold abroad for safety purposes, if they felt their assets were threatened, this could be a danger for Putin. But so far, uh, relatively few of his inner circle have actually suffered from this. Uh, the second part of the sanctions uh, is uh, our um, prohibitions on the export of high-tech equipment, primarily oil technology, to uh, Russia. The third one is the most interesting, and it's the one very few people understand. A and it is that uh, credit institutions, banks, insurance companies, etc., throughout the Western world are not allowed to make loans to Russia, to enterprise, to Russian companies that are on the sanctions list. They cannot make loans uh, with a term of one year or more. Now this doesn't sound very impressive, but this is the real bite of the sanctions on Russia. The reason for this is that one of the things the Russian economy failed to develop was a capital market. You therefore have the so-called national champions of Russia, the, the Rusneft, the Gazprom, uh, etc., uh, having to borrow money in Europe and the United States for uh, investment capital. They have been borrowing for quite a while. Uh, the Western lending institutions have been willing lenders. They have become highly leveraged, so they have uh, very high debts, uh, some of which are coming due. Under normal circumstances, they would, um, they would roll over these debts by additional lending. An example uh, is the national oil company, Rosneft, uh, which has an enormous debt burden, uh, a lot of debt becoming uh, uh, maturing, and there's no place to go to get the money. Other than to the Russian government, uh, which has built up rainy day funds during periods of high energy prices. According to current Ministry of Finance uh, estimates, the rainy day funds uh, will be used up this year and the next. So there will be no rainy day funds in, say, two, you know, late 2016. So one should not underestimate the power of these financial sanctions. One of the few weapons the United States still has at its disposal is a real control of the international financial system because we are the um, international currency. Uh, we are the, um, trying to think of the term used, I can't think of it right now, but basically U.S. banks and Treasury uh, control uh, the financial system of the world. If you do not believe me, look at how quickly Switzerland caved when the U.S. Treasury came to it and, and demanded that it disclose the names of Americans who had secret bank accounts in Switzerland. Another piece of evidence is the fact that China has recently reneged on a loan it was going to make to the Russian energy sector for fear that it might get into trouble with the U.S. Treasury. So these, these uh, financial um, sanctions are the ones that really, really count. Uh, let me see if I have a... OK, 
Can you show this? Um, here is Russia's foreign debt maturing within a year. And this is straight out of the Central Bank of Russia website. Uh, and it says that um, uh, that's around $150 billion uh, is due. And somehow the Russian companies, the Russian government, et cetera, must come up with this money simply to finance investment that has already taken place. You can contrast this with the international reserves of Russia, which is 350, so that's about 40% of total reserves. So uh, you can uh, drop this chart to the screen now. Hello, get rid of it, thank you. Uh, let's see if I have another. Okay, so what has Russia done? I can actually divide this into sort of different parts, and let's see how I organize this. I call this a double whammy because the double whammy is the um, simultaneous collapse of oil prices plus being uh, kicked out of world credit markets. So let's see how we can organize this. Um, let's begin with, um, not with um, um, being kicked out of the credit market, but let's look at the oil shock. So let's, let's separate that out if we can. Uh, the oil shock uh, is indeed a shock for the Russian economy. Although Putin promised in, early in his regime that he would make the Russian economy less dependent on oil, this has not happened. So if anything, the Russian economy is more dependent on oil. When he came in, around 42 or 3 percent of state revenue derived from energy, now it's above 50 percent. So you can imagine what happens to a country's public finances if the source of income that accounts for 52% uh, of its revenue is suddenly cut in half because energy oil prices have fallen by about a half. If you look at, at the export prices they're getting, and uh, within a few months, this will hit the prices of natural gas because the prices of natural gas are tied, are indexed to the price of oil uh, some six months after the fact. So, uh, problem number one, if you are Putin or Putin's Minister of Finance, is how are you going to make up for this uh, loss, and I guess it's about a quarter of uh, revenue. Uh, so, I'll tell you exactly what they've been doing, because um, this is public information, the Ministry of Finance uh, publishes this stuff. Here's how they've, they've managed. They have um, taken some $50 billion from the Social Security Trust Fund lockbox. Uh, they actually uh, have something similar to a lockbox, but the lockbox is now empty. So they've, um, uh, and let me give you another figure just to keep in mind. In order to keep investment constant, the Russian economy must raise something like $300 billion worth of investment finance. So if you think of, 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 of filling in that hole, uh, $50 billion from the trust fund lockbox fills five divided, 50 divided by uh, 300. So it, it fills a good portion of it, but not very much. Um, there are other things that have they've done. I'm not going to go into the detail, but clearly, uh, if you've lost this much revenue, you're going to have to uh, engage in budget cuts, and the budget cuts have been very severe, with the exception of defense and propaganda. 
Putin spends an enormous amount on propaganda, uh, almost as much as on uh, education. So you can see for him this is a huge uh, priority for him. If you look at the actual budget cuts, uh, they hit primarily public employees who are going to get no salary increases this year. Uh, they hit pensioners who are going to get a 5% increase, but I'm talking about nominal uh, values. The inflation rate is predicted to be 12 to 14 percent. So if you are a public employee and your salary doesn't go up, your, your standard of living has gone down 12 to 14 percent. If you're a pensioner, your standard of living has gone down 6 or 7 percent. I emphasize this point because this is Putin's core constituency, public employees and pensioners. He sold himself to the Russian people, to the pensioners in particular, by saying, I'm going to pay your pensions on time. Yeltsin did not. I'm hence a better president. So the fact that he is basically abandoning this constituency must have been a bitter pill for him to swallow. Uh, now, if we go back to this $300 billion figure, which is how much they have to raise in order to keep investment constant. So they've gotten some of it from the trust fund. Uh, they've, uh, they are now in the process of using up their rainy day funds uh, accumulated during years of high oil prices. Uh, but still, they're, they're falling short for uh, uh, some reasons associated with the uh, sanctions, because um, if you go back to a normal period, uh, Russian, the Russian economy would receive about $50 billion a year in syndicated loans from Western credit markets, and they would receive 50 to 60 to $70 billion in foreign direct investment. That is now zero. So that's a loss of um, $120 billion right there, uh, which doesn't cover much of the, um, of the um, revenue taken out of the trust fund. I don't want to belabor this point other than to say, once you see figures like this, you understand the non-seriousness of the Russian claim that the sanctions are not hurting them. They're hurting very much, and they are causing some very tough decisions uh, to be made. The second problem, uh, again associated with, and this is directly associated with sanctions, is uh, what to do about foreign exchange. Because um, you have these uh, debts maturing, and I think it was $150 billion. Uh, you cannot borrow the money, uh, so you have to somehow get foreign exchange. Where are you going to get it? The upper limit on what you can get uh, is if all um, export earnings minus imports would equal a large sum of money because that is, that is your ultimate source of foreign exchange. When energy prices are falling, you're earning less foreign exchange, uh, and even if all of that foreign exchange is brought back into Russia, you're still going to have significant shortfalls. To give you an example of, of this, uh, I was reading, I think, the Sunday New York Times, uh, uh, something about Riviera real estate. And Riviera real estate, uh, French R Riviera real estate, has fallen by 25%. It's fallen by 25% because the order has gone out to Putin's um, uh, inner circle and uh, colleagues 
that whatever they earn abroad can no longer be spent on London townhouses and French uh, Riviera villas. It all has to come back. The recent rise in the Russian exchange rate, which they crow about as demonstrating the crisis is over, uh, is largely a result of what we would call forced repatriation. That is, the word is out, Gazprom, you can't, Gazprom officials, you can no longer steal this money, you have to bring it back home. And that has worked, but there are limits on how far this can work. Um, now let me go to this, I think it'll be my final point, and, uh, and this has to do with history repeating itself. So I'd like to go to a, a graph. And this is it, if you could show it. Can you see it? So, uh, I would like you to look at the blue line, which is Russian GDP. The, I guess that chartreuse line is the price of oil dollars per barrel. The green-like line is the exchange rate. Um, no, the, uh, is, is that right? That's right. Yeah. It, yeah, that's the orange mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. and aqua? Okay. And then international reserves. That's the yellow. The yellow. No, uh, I have them mislabeled. That's the reason I was confused. The um, yellow line is international reserves. The aqua line is, no? Exchange rates, because look where exchange rates have gone. Yeah. Uh, the, yellow, the yellow is the exchange rate, yeah. yeah. And remember on this chart, when the exchange rate goes up, that's bad for Russia the ruble is becoming less less valuable. I would like you to look at, I assume this works. Oh, okay, yeah, that's <coughs> rubles per dollar. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Okay. I apologize. No, it, I, I can, it's my mistake. So, if you look at GDP, this is the financial crisis. Uh, Russian GDP declined by about 8%, which was a lot uh, for the financial crisis. Um, and you can see that the collapse of the energy price uh, is what's causing this to happen. There's a slight lag. So the energy price falls first, and then it's followed by the GDP decline. The thing I want to emphasize is the rather short duration of the collapse of energy prices. So it's down, then it starts going back up. Imagine now if the price of energy had gone like that, say for five years. Uh, we don't know what would have happened. It didn't happen. But the fact that there was this very rapid recovery of the energy price, you can see is what made the decline in GDP management. Now if we go to the sanctions um, period and um, what I've put in where you see those basically horizontal lines, I put in the estimates of the Minister, Ministry of Finance for what the exchange rate is going to be, what the price of oil is going to be, etc. and then projected GDP on the basis of those numbers. And I assume that the energy price is going to be low for about two years. Uh, and look what happens. You get basically a, that's probably about a 15 uh, or 17 percent decline in GDP, which is a disastrous uh, decline in GDP, and then you don't have a recovery. Now one can say, well, there were no sanctions during this period but there are sanctions during this period. The two 
periods, however, are very similar because, as you may recall, during the financial crisis, there was a freezing of credit, and particularly a freezing of credit in the emerging markets. If you look at the syndicated loan market uh, for Russia during this period, it went from like 60 billion ruble, uh, dollars to about 4 billion. So it was almost as if there were sanctions in place. So these two are quite similar in reality, only these were not sanctions, it was just a freezing up of the credit market. Now, if this type of analysis is correct, the Russian economy is in for very hard times. But this leaves, uh, yeah, you can turn it off now. Uh, no, leave it on, because I have one, one other thing. Let's look at Venezuela. And I've learned by talking to colleagues that this is sort of a new area of growth theory and measurement of growth, because uh, what I showed you earlier was conventional calculations of real GDP. So you take the prices of the country, uh, you hold them fixed, and you look, and from this you try to figure out the increase or de decrease in the real output of goods and services in the country's own prices. There is an alternate way of doing this, which is called purchasing power parity, where you try to figure out what you can actually buy with your income. And th this is done largely on a um, on international comparison basis. You know about that because these are ten world tables. Uh, and something very interesting happens to the energy producing countries. Uh, the, let's see what it is. The, the blue line is the uh, purchasing power parity calculation. The whatever, what, chartreuse or well, I don't know what that is. Uh, this is um, in national prices. Uh, this is Venezuela and you can see that when you do it in purchasing power parity, the decline in output is much more pronounced. If you do this for Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia's GDP falls to about a half. So this is perhaps a way to capture the effect of energy prices on standards of living. And it's, it's obvious, if, if you live in a country that's used to earning uh, $200 billion from oil exports and suddenly they only earn half that much, this is going to have to have an effect on the standard of living. So here's what the Russian numbers look like. So you can see what happens when energy prices are rising and then the sharp decline. That decline is something like uh, 17% of GDP, whereas the, the other one is like 8%. Uh, it turns out no one really knows how to interpret these things, so uh, perhaps uh, if I speak here again, I could give you a more uh, definitive answer. Uh, if you can turn it off, I will conclude by saying that the sanctions matter. Uh, the Russian economy, unless the sanctions are removed, or unless the price of oil and gas miraculously recovers, is in for a very hard time. We do not know the effect that this economic catastrophe, if you want to call it that, will have on decision making within the Kremlin. Uh, Putin, I believe, is motivated not by economic factors, but by other factors. Uh, however, you cannot really ignore these things. Uh, an example being, when Crimea was annexed, the Russian pension system got all the Crimean pensioners, and about half of the Crimean population received pensions. This alone, uh, 
cut into cost of living increases in 2014, and Crimea is a tiny place. If you calculate what it would cost for the Russian budget to pay the pensions of uh, the people of Donbass, Donetsk and Luhansk, it's a huge sum of money. In uh, the um, so-called volunteers fighting in East Ukraine from Russia are supposedly earning about $100 a day. That costs money. So even though uh, you would like to ignore economics, you can't ignore economics uh, completely. Uh, let me stop there because I think uh, we could have perhaps an interesting conversation about some of the things I brought up. So I look forward to your comments. All right. Very, very interesting. Um, lead off. Uh, in, introduce yourself uh, so that Paul will know. And, and tell him where you're from. Good evening. I'm um, Alexei Lin. I'm a full resident from Russia, studying here at the school. Yeah, we can start over. Uh, all right, once again. Is it working? Is it on? It worked for just a second. Well, just uh, talk. Go ahead and talk. Talk. Yeah, now you're on. All right. My name is Alexey Lin. I'm a Fulbright student from Russia, studying here at the Post School of Government and Public Service. So, thank you very much, Professor Gregory, for uh, conducting this talk. And I would like to start with. Uh, sexual data, and then I'll go to my question. So, sure. um, first of all, you mentioned that the annexation of Crimea was the first uh, change of borders by military power. It was not the first one, in my opinion. Kosovo. Yes, Kosovo was the first one. Uh, second were proclamation of independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia in the same year, 2008. So Crimea was the third one. Uh, second, you were speaking about that Russia will have somehow to pay off that is, as you mentioned, three hundred billion dollars a year, right? Uh, uh, the, the the three hundred billion is the amount of investment uh, uh, well, in the Russian economy. Yeah, my point is, it doesn't necessarily. It's not necessarily going to because there is an option of imposing a moratorium on foreign debt payments, and actually that was announced, not by the government, but by the opposition, and in particular by an expert, economic expert, Vladislav Nazemtsev, who is in the opposition. Uh, but somehow, for some reason, uh, the economy ministry denied this option. They said it's going to affect the reputation of Russia. But if the West imposes additional sanctions, I think Russia will, will be going. We'll have nothing to lose, so the investors probably are not going to get this money back. And now back to the question. I understood your central question in this presentation, but I didn't understand your central point. So you said that it's important to sort, sort of sanctions from the impact of oil prices. And I think you miss here the third variable. In my opinion, it is Russian domestic economic politics. And I agree with you that this policy was quite ineffective in the rest 15 years. Uh, so what I expected to hear from you, uh, if we take the whole damage to Russian economy for 100, how much in percentage goes to a change in oil prices, how much does go to sanctions, and how much to uh, Russia's own mistakes in domestic economic policy. Thank you. Yeah, no, these are good points. Um, I, I, I need to learn more about Kosovo because that is the, the usual counter-argument one hears if you claim this is the first change in international borders. Uh, it's argued Kosovo uh, came earlier. Uh, I would love to answer the question, but I don't know much about Kosovo. Um, Abkhazia uh, are very much like um, the Crimea, East Ukraine. Uh, you know, we can argue about it, but uh, there was a war between Georgia and Russia 
there's a lot of dispute as to who started it, but clearly it was not in the Georgians' interest to be involved in a war against Russia. And Abkhazia um, became basically a frozen conflict. And have they had a referendum, and are they now a part of uh, appealing to become part of Russia? I, I don't know the latest. Abkhazia. I'm not sure if Putin is going to accept them, just like uh, the Donetsk and Lugansk republics, they also appealed. Yeah. Uh, they also appealed for uh, membership in the Russian Federation after the referendum, but Putin, in fact, didn't recognize them. His, his position in the plan of taking yeah. them. Uh, let me say that um, I, I believe it's clear Putin does not want the Donetsk People's Republic and does not want the Luhansk People's Republic. He wants them to re remain, what he says, a part of unitary Ukraine, uh, but with veto power over major policy issues, uh, which is unacceptable to the Ukrainians, which explains why a peaceful resolution at this point is not possible. As far as... Um, the toughest question of all, which is, you know, what percent is due to the uh, oil price, what percent is due to uh, the sanctions? Uh, I have a colleague who's, who's tried to answer that question really based upon uh, looking at, mo at monetary statistics. And um, if you use simply the monetary statistics, where it's very hard to uh, or wash out the effects of energy, uh, he would be about 50-50 on this, but I don't have a scientific answer to your question. I think one can look at, uh, at Iran, perhaps, and uh, try to get an answer from Iran, because there you, <clears throat> you don't necessarily have two or three things going on at once. Uh, quickly, on domestic policy, Putin was actually a fairly good uh, president for about the first four or five years. He was following liberal policies. <coughs> uh, he then abandoned that policy. Uh, I can't give you the year, 2006, 2007, 2005, I don't know. And after that, it became clear there really weren't going to be further reforms. And therefore, there weren't really good prospects for uh, rapid growth after that. So uh, that's the best I can do. Do we have other questions? Dr. Gregory, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Seth Dunbar. I'm a national security student here at the Bush School. Uh, Are you an officer? Uh, no. You're not. I'm not. Uh, two questions for you, though. First, can you speak a little bit about the role of the Russian Central Bank in the economic crisis? They tried to raise rates in response to currency fluctuations earlier this year and then ultimately ended up lowering them fairly shortly thereafter. And then two, you mentioned the impact of the sanctions on long-term funding. Dead after, I think it was a year. Yeah. Uh, which makes sense because a lot of the industries you named are very capital intensive. But what about short term overnight funding? That became such an issue here during the financial crisis. Are Russian firms as dependent on that as American firms are? Uh, tough questions. Um, the Russian Central Bank uh, did raise interest rates, I think, like to 16%, something like that, uh, to uh, prevent a run on the ruble uh, because the one thing Russian citizens know is the exchange rate. Am I correct? Right. Because if you're in Moscow or anywhere in Russia, you walk down the street and every fifth store is an exchange store where you can exchange currency. And they'll put the exchange rate uh, uh, um, on a sort of like on a blackboard in front. So every, every Russian knows the exchange rate. And so they'll, uh, Russians will key off the exchange rate to judge just how well things are going or how badly things are going. The Russian central, uh, one way to prevent a run on the ruble is to offer very high interest rate. Because even though you're taking a risk that the ruble will further devalue, uh, you're being rewarded with this extraordinarily high interest rate. So uh, that, I, I think, you know, was not a bad move by the central bank. Uh, the central bank has subsequently lowered that interest rate 14%, something like that. Yeah, 
Um, the central bank is doing a sleight of hand trick, uh, however, and that sleight of hand trick is something called the repo market, which is, is supposed to be a, an overnight market, but in Russia it's something quite different. Uh, what the Russian central bank is doing is taking uh, the uh, debts of companies under attack like Rosneft and they are, are uh, buying these debts uh, with uh, their foreign exchange reserves. So the central bank is not intervening directly in the foreign exchange market. It's simply giving the Rosneft's and the Gazprom's, et cetera, uh, liquidity to uh, meet these <coughs> notes that are maturing. Uh, the Russian credit market is pretty miserable in all aspects. Uh, so I don't think they would have a very good uh, overnight market. What's going to happen, though, when that rainy day fund uh, runs out? The rainy day fund is really um, you know, providing um, something like a quarter of investment finance yeah. right now. And so uh, what's Putin is, is actually facing an interesting choice. Do you bail out your friends who own or manage Rosneft or Gazprom or Luke Oil or whatever? Uh, or uh, do you try to you know, uh, keep pensions increasing at the rate of inflation and so forth? The rainy day funds are being used up very quickly, and there's a long line of companies um, making claims on the rainy day fund. And I think it's very significant that um, public employees are going to experience a huge loss in their standard of living. And as I say, that's a core, uh, uh, that's a, that's a core constituency. I hope I answered as best I could. Thank you. Thank you. Stand up. Well, no, uh, this gentleman is getting the mic. You're going to be next. My first question kind of keys off of that. Identify yourself. Oh, I'm, I'm Philip Vetter. I've actually been applied mathematics, but I'm interested in okay. geopolitical things. So um, a lot of regimes not depend on the approval of the entire population, but just you know enough of the powerful. Um, and um, will that work for Putin? And uh, is that enough for him? I would say. Uh, very important to understand how Putin thinks about these things. And no one really can look inside his, his, his brain and understand how he thinks. What I do know is that he was very frightened by the so-called Euromaidan movement in Kiev, uh, which actually overthrew a, a standing government and the standing government of which he approved. And this occurred in February of 2014. In December of 2011, the Russian, at least the Moscow population, became quite incensed by the uh, rigging of the uh, parliamentary elections. And uh, there were, for the first time, really big demonstrations in Moscow. There's a lot of dispute how many people, uh, but you know, at least 50,000, maybe 70,000, were out on the streets. And uh, at that time, Putin uh, was in real danger. Uh, there was actually a quite negative um, sort of expose of Putin on national television, uh, which portrayed him as a crook. And this was on national television. So I think at that time, this inner circle of the Kremlin, whatever that is, was seriously thinking about dumping him. So for him, the worst thing that could happen is people going out on the streets, demonstrating and overthrowing what he regarded as a legitimate uh, government. Uh, I'm straying from your question, but perhaps uh, by chance I've, I've answered it. Uh, 
one often hears, well, he has an 85% approval rating. And any any uh, American politi politician would kill for that type of rating. Uh, we don't know the dynamics of, of, of that because in Russia, uh, if you ask people, name your five favorite politicians, they'd have trouble. Let me try as an experiment. Uh, are you from Russia? Oh, well, we're going to hear perhaps a different story. From you. Uh, uh, you're from you're from, anyone else from Russia? There? Okay, name name uh, five five Russian politicians. Um, I have trouble with that. Um, no, well, I've asked Ken. Uh, uh, either or. What is that? Any politician? Uh, yeah, a, a political leader. Proposing, proposing it could be a member of parliament, could be a member of the cabinet, it could be the president, it could be the prime minister. The name five. <laughs> no, this is five, five, five names. Five names. Okay, so you know the, who the prime minister is. You you know that Putin is the president. Okay, you know the finance minister. The defense minister. Ex finance minister. Yeah, anyway, he's a politician. Yeah, sure. He can be considered. Okay. Uh, but you're you're highly educated. If you go into um, a provincial t town, uh, would they have trouble naming five? I don't know. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> I would say that. Okay. The the the, the question uh, public opinion surveyors ask is. What do you do about a country where the people really only know one name or two names? And uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's, it's discussed. But he does have this, this very high popularity rating, which is very difficult to, to uh, evaluate. Uh, if I could, is, is somebody up there? Because I, I have a little diagram on that. We're going to have to have to take one more question. Well, let's let our Ukrainian young Ukrainian lady take it. I'll take question. Uh, well, maybe two more. Questions. Okay. Um, is there somebody up there? Yes. Yeah, okay. Put it up right okay. There. This one. There it is. Approval. Look at that. It's gone up. <laughs> okay. No, no, now, um, Putin begins. He's appointed prime minister by Yeltsin, who's very unpopular. Uh, Putin's popularity is around 27%. Um, it shoots up. And why does it shoot up? Che the, 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 the Chechen War? No, the Chechen War. There was a uh, massive uh, uh, outflow of patriotism. Uh, Putin is a hard, hard guy. Uh, the Chechens are thugs. He's killing them. Everything's fine. And so the Chechen War got him up there. Um, then you have actually a pretty strong economy, which is helping. Then you get uh, um, the Olympics. Well, the Olympics, I don't know. Uh, here we have uh, Georgia, 2008. Uh, and then we have Putin coming down. And what's this uptick here? Crimea and Ukraine. So, uh, you know, what this suggests is yeah. when Putin's in trouble, it's a foreign adventure. Uh, and that's the way I read this. Uh, but we need to fit in two questions. Yeah. Tatiana, tell them. She's one of my, my star okay. students. Okay. Um, Mr. Gregory, uh, uh, where are you from? I'm from Ukraine. What city? Uh, I was born in Odessa. It's in the south. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but I. I was educated and lived in Kiev and worked there. Where? In Kiev, in the okay. capital. Yes, and uh, I'm where did you go to school? Diplomatic Academy of Ukraine. Okay. And here I studied international economics with concentration on refugee policy and management. So with this.